My first year in the Twin Cities, I practically lived at the center. I wrote my plays on the center's computers. I printed them out on the center's copy machine. I wouldn't be a writer uh, if it wasn't for the Playwrights Center. It started my career. Just as a playwright, it's so uh, nice to have a home. It's a place where your play can just be in process and can be finding itself. Everyone sort of rallies behind the playwright to be the guide as the play finds its form. So much of who I am today as a writer and as a human is thanks to the Playwright Center. And I am, above all else, enormously grateful. Happy Taste of the Season 2020. My name is Jeremy Cohen, and I am the Producing Artistic Director here at the Playwright Center. And I've been locked inside this theater for the past seven months, so please, God, someone, come let me out. Almost ten years ago to the day, I was standing on this very stage, introducing myself and welcoming you to our first ever Taste of the Season. This vital program connects you, our most beloved community, with the playwrights we serve, and at the same time, provides a critical platform to amplify their stories. I want to acknowledge the moment we're in, and I want to thank you so much for watching. I know how zoomed out we all are right about now. On the other hand, as we keep prioritizing at the center, this online world does allow us to invest much more deeply into our, our greater accessibility to our work. And so, to our out-of-state friends and our international friends, welcome. We are so thrilled to have you join us here today. Throughout the past seven months, we have curated an entirely new slate of programming that prioritizes paying our playwrights and theater making community, all while seeking to keep us connected during these uncertain times. Since launching our online programming, we have reached over 5,000 online participants, and the season ahead promises much more of the same. So when we started thinking about how we would produce Taste of the Season this fall, it seemed impossible not to gather in some way and to share our excitement for the incoming cohort of incredible playwrights this year. For those of you who have been to Taste of the Season before, the program format will seem much the same, minus all the hugging in the lobby. For our first timers, welcome. Over the next few minutes, you will be taken on a journey into the homes of four incredible playwrights. You'll learn about their writing process and they'll share an excerpt of a new play they'll be working on and sharing with audiences here this season. So I'm thrilled to introduce you to Rihanna Yazi, Jessica Huang, Dipika Guha, and Harrison David Rivers. These four Playwright Center artists are part of the cohort of core writers, playwriting fellows, and affiliated writers who will all develop their new work with us over the next 12 months. And then at the end of each excerpt, Haley Finn, our Associate Artistic Director and Taste of the Season's own sommelier, will share a wine pairing that complements the writing and the writers perfectly. Even though we're not together here at the Playwright Center this year, I hope you'll still lean forward into their stories, sip some wine or other adjacent beverages, and join us this season from the comfort of your own home. I invite you to visit our website, pwcenter.org, and learn about all of this season's writers and their unique stories. For the safety and health of all the artists we work with, we have decided to produce all 75 of our new play workshops online this season and to reinvest our housing and travel dollars back into increased rehearsal time and increased compensation for all of the artists. And while there are a few savings as a result of our online transition, these of course make up only the tiniest dent in the face of the immense challenge our entire theater field now faces. Here at the center, we do not rely on ticket sales, but we are also not at all impervious to the current decline in arts funding. Taste of the Season is traditionally a vital fundraiser for us. Last year, we raised over $50,000. So, if at the end of this video you were moved by the work and fired up to support diverse and vital theater makers, we hope you will strongly consider hitting the donate button. You can also make a gift online at pwcenter.org slash donate. I know that many of you watching have already made a generous donation, and so my sincere thanks to you for doing so. Also, a special thanks to France 44, our supporting sponsor and official wine provider for Taste of the Season. Live theater will return. And with your help and our resources, it will be stronger than ever. Thank you for joining us and enjoy Taste of the Season.
Hi, my name is Rihanna Yazi, and I am an affiliated writer at the Playwright Center. I've been involved with the Playwright Center since 2006 when I moved to Minnesota as a Jerome Fellow. Um, then two years later, I was another Jerome Fellow again, and then following that, I was a, a core writer. And then in 2016, I was uh, a McKnight Fellow uh, with the Playwright Center. Uh, I wouldn't be a writer uh, if it wasn't for the Playwright Center. Um, it was the organization that kind of gave me the first validation nationally that um, I could be a playwright. And sort of, and it did, it started my career. And um, um, so I, I am super thankful that the Playwright Center um, had the Jerome Fellowship um, and that they had a year-long residency because um, I was able to move to Minnesota. I ended up living here and I started a theater company, um, a Native American theater company called New Native Theater. So pretty much my whole life has become um, revolving around the fact that the Playwright Center uh, believed in me. And I was thinking about this last night, how of all the different hats that I wear in the world, because I'm an artistic director of a 12 year old native theater company now, um, I, I do other kinds of advocacy, um, but um, the Playwright Center is the one place where everybody sees me as a playwright, and that's what I see myself as um, underneath all the, um, all the things that I do, all of the hats that I wear, um, I'm number one a playwright, and it's um, it's great uh, being at the Playwright Center because when they see me, they see Rihanna Yazi the playwright, not Rihanna Yazi the X Y Z. I came up with the idea to write my play Nancy um, when I was doing quite a bit of research on another play. Uh, that I was commissioned to write about a pivotal moment in American history and that play is about Pocahontas and um, uh, while I was doing the research I found out that um, a genealogist had traced Nancy Reagan's um, lineage from Pocahontas and I just couldn't resist writing that play <laughs> because it also played a bunch of parallels for me and how I saw um, the way that um, it's possible in Indian country for some people with a very small bit of heritage, native heritage or um, colorism, um, people who are white passing, have an ability to um, take advantage of being one of the most oppressed uh, peoples in the country. And so it was such an interesting juxtaposition to talk about the life of Nancy Reagan and talk about the life of uh, Indian people who are actually experiencing um, systemic racism and racism. I am reading an excerpt from my new play called Nancy, which is a loosely based bio on Nancy Reagan. I'm reading a scene with Esmeralda, who is Navajo, speaking to Whaley, who is Ojibwe, and they are being affected by President Reagan's economic policies in Indian country. Esmeralda. But she's not Indian, Whaley. Who are you to say someone is Indian or not? You have dark brown eyes, brown skin, and black hair. So do you. So that makes our opinion count more? I mean, there hasn't been a day in my life I haven't had to be Indian and haven't had to deal with the ongoing history of shit that it means to be Indian or deal with the way people treat me just by looking at me. I was raised by my grandparents in a Hogan who were raised by people who went on the long walk. Well, for me, I think that's privilege. I think being one of the most powerful and richest women in the country is a privilege, and even if she wasn't either of those, she's white. Be careful about race baiting. There hasn't been one moment in Nancy's entire existence where she's felt unwelcome in any space she's ever wanted to step into, including Hyannisport. You know your culture, you know your language. Right, and every day of my childhood, if I accidentally said something in Navajo at boarding school, I was slapped. I had to eat soap. But look where you are now because of that. You're the richest one of us all. You have a spiritual connection that tells you who you are. Your being and your culture is intact. Right, that Indian school sure left me intact. Did you go to ceremonies? 
Yes, when I was home summers and Christmas time for 18 years. Do you know how many Indian people couldn't do that? How many didn't know their language and still had to eat soap? How many Indian people where I'm from had to go into hiding? We all had to hide our ceremonies, some more than others. We were on shit land that no one wanted to go near with a 10-foot pole. And my land was covered in timber, and every Pillsbury, Kellogg, and Rockefeller on the planet fought for that lumber to build their empires. Yes, I understand, and I couldn't tell you any more how I deeply know if you dissected my heart to see how broken it is. But there's no way I have more privilege than Nancy Reagan. Crazy Horse was half white, and Injun Joe. I'm not sure why you and I have to argue like this. Yes, my skin, my eyes, my hair are dark. No, I don't need to tell anyone else whether or not they're Indian. Honestly, I don't care. I've got bigger problems than sniffing out fake Indians. I love non-Indians. I love my daughter's father. She's half. Look, Nancy doesn't need my help. Navajo widows asking themselves why their husbands died, why their livestock was failing, why their own health was poor. It was uranium mines. No one told them about the dangers. There's hundreds of abandoned mines on my res, and the last active one is closing this year because of those widows. And if I can be helpful in supporting those women to do the work they need to make their hearts whole again, that's what I'm dedicated to. They needed someone to give them rides to the market, supervise the tiniest of business plans so their rugs could be sold at a fair price, so they could get a plane ticket to D.C. to tell the president what he's doing to endanger the Indian, the Navajo people. Yes. If Nancy wants to do that work, then yes. Come on home to the res, Nancy. I'm waiting with open arms. You're passionate. Rihanna Yazzie's Nancy is smart, bold, and funny, and a lovely pairing with the Gruet Brute, which balances perfectly on the palate, a combination of wit and bite, comprised of 75% Chardonnay and 25% Pinot Noir. This wine is made in New Mexico and is the product of a unique partnership between Gruet and the Santa Ana Pueblo tribe in New Mexico. The Pueblo of Santa Ana owns and manages the Tamaya Vineyard, where the grapes are grown, making it one of a handful of Native American tribes across the country to grow grapes commercially. The Tamaya Vineyard is only 16 miles from Albuquerque, where Rihanna grew up, so offers a nod to her roots. I invite you to pour your glass now. Hi, my name is Jessica Huang. I have been hanging out at the Playwright Center since 2012, so for eight years and counting. Uh, I have been a Many Voices Fellow, a Jerome Fellow twice, and now I'm an affiliated writer. And my play, Mother of Exiles, will be developed during Play Labs. The Playwright Center has developed nearly every single play of mine, maybe multiple times. And every time it's every time the play has needed something different, and um, and the Playwright Center is a place where everybody sort of conspires to give the play exactly what it needs. I think that the word I would use to describe the Playwright Center is process, which to me is sort of a beloved sacred word. Um, I think it's a place where you don't have to. You don't have to be writing for a producer or even necessarily writing for an audience yet. Um, it's a place where your play can just be in process and can be finding itself. Um, and it's also a place where, um, where everyone sort of rallies behind the playwright to be the guide as the play finds its form. Mother of Exiles is about the Loy family over 160 years of um, their time in America. Um, it's about sacrifice and courage and systems of oppression in the U.S. Um, and it takes place in sort of three separate chunks, one in 1898, one in 1998, and one in uh, 2068. 
Um, the part you're about to see takes place in 1998 during the um, wet foot, dry foot policy in Miami dealing with um, immigrants from Cuba. And, uh, and just before this excerpt, um, a woman named Claudia has stepped off a raft into um, the life of Braulio Loy, who is a border cop. Um, and, uh, and then a call comes in over the walkie from his superior. A call comes in over the walkie. Is everything okay? New kid, is something the matter? A moment, Claudia drops to her knees, raises her hands. Bruno, is everything okay? A very, very long moment. Finally, Braulio says, everything is fine. Yeah, yeah, everything is fine. So what's the deal, you fucking coming or not? Uh, yeah. You're fucking coming? I, y yeah, yeah, I'm coming. He's fucking coming, go, fi go fucking figure. Okay, new kid, 10-4, over and out. Claudia says, thank you. I don't know what I'm doing. You are doing a good job. <laughs> that, that is one thing I am definitely, definitely not doing. I'm just as bad as my grandparents, my great grandparents. Worse because I knew better. I knew, hey, hey now, this is me you're talking about, me. You are protecting me. And I tell you, I think for that, your family would be proud. I'm not here to make them proud. I'm here to atone, atone. They broke the law, a dragony, thundery sound. They know they did. What does a law know about people like them, like you? It's the law. Where I come from, the law does not allow us to eat. It doesn't care if we have clothes or a place to sleep, but people do. People share their fruits and drive you to work. The law listens and snatches and imprisons, but people save you from the sharks. I don't know what I'm doing. Listen. Where I come from, you have to listen through the walls to hear if your neighbors are talking. You have to watch for things like stolen tires or tubing or gasoline. You have to report, it's the law. A senior Braulio lived down the street from my parents and gave mangoes to the kids. And one time, late at night, when I was bringing home planks of woods, wood that I borrowed from the school fence, he gave one to me too. He knew what he was doing, and you do too. Don't you? You know. It's only you, right? Nice to meet you, Braulio. Now turn around. Don't watch. Turn around and you never saw me. So my play, Mother of Exiles, is an exploration of borders, of immigration, of interracial love, um, family, throughout American history and the future. Um, but it's also an exploration of form. And each of the three uh, sections of the play have their own distinct sort of form and tone. Um, and I'm really excited through Play Labs to work on pushing each of those forms and experiments toward their, toward their extreme, in a way. Considering the importance of strong female characters in this play, it seemed essential to pair Mothers of Exile with a wine produced by strong women. So here you have Sichele Grecanico, a Sicilian wine produced by a sister team. Family is central to Mothers of Exile as well. This is an organic wine, and the producers practice biodynamic principles in line with the natural wine movement, which uses minimal intervention to create a greater connection between the wine and the land. The winemakers have created a polyculture to ensure ecosystem stability. In much of Jessica's work, and here as well, you will see plays that address environmental concerns, so it seemed necessary to pair Jessica's play with a wine that embodied the values imbued in the play. Jessica's plays also experiment with form and tone, and here you have an orange wine, which is a white wine made in the same style as a red wine. 
pour and sip before proceeding. Hi everyone, my name is Deepika Guha and I'm a playwright and I'm fortunate enough to be a core writer at the Playwright Centre in Minneapolis. Just as a playwright, it's so uh, nice to have a home. It's so rare that we do have homes. We've, um, and some of that can be, and it's, that's always inspiring and always wonderful to be working with new sets of collaborators on on our projects but it's also really important to have those places that you can come back to and that's what the Playwright Centre means to me and um, the last time uh, I was with you it was on Zoom we were working on this play Getting There and that was a whole new universe um, uh, but always really good to connect to um, the sort of heart of what the work is, um, which I find is always something that is easy for me to do when, when I'm with all of you. Um, it's so clear what the, uh, what the goal is and, and that, the, that it's all about process um, and that, that's something that I always find reassuring. And the first time uh, I was with you I got to work on a play called Malicious Animal Magnetism which I'm co-writing with Jeremy Cohen, who you know a little bit uh, at the Playwright Centre. Um, and Jeremy's such a beloved collaborator that it was just really nice to be in his home, um, and in his literal home, and uh, to be building the play uh, in that space was really magical. So the idea for getting there came from a conversation that I had with um, artistic director Ed Decker, who commissioned it, and he runs a theatre called the new Conservatory Theatre Centre in um, San Francisco and we were just talking very generally about friendship and um, how come there were so few plays about friendship uh, and uh, and queer friendship and, and queer relationships um, in, in particular and so I wanted to write something that carried that sort of DNA, had that sort of atmosphere that was both philosophical and searching and um, asking some of those same questions about grief and loss. Uh, characters had uh, emerged for me by that point and so um, lucky for everyone, I think, myself most of all probably, that I found my way back to those questions through, through these people and they're the people who are carrying the play forward. So Getting There is about five women who are encountering each other in Paris and it's about how the nature of those encounters changes each of their lives. Um, Radha and Anissa are Parisian professors in their 60s who hit a rough patch in their marriage. Anissa has just been diagnosed with a terminal illness. And that is when Kai, who is American and young and fresh out of college and encountering love for the first time, meets them. So in this scene, um, Radha has uh, just come home from a conference and she has, they've met Kai all but once and she's invited Kai to come and live with them to Anissa's disappointment and dismay. Anissa and Radha's Parisian apartment. Kai sits comfortably making herself at home. In an adjacent room, Anissa and Radha make the bed while they struggle to keep their voices down. Kai can hear every word. Radha, well, why not? She hasn't been here in months. The room's empty. Anissa, well, what if she did come home? Where would she sleep? Radha, your daughter's made it quite clear she has other priorities. You didn't ask me how it went. Anissa, I saw on Twitter. Congratulations. Radha, so it was good in the end that I went to the conference. Anissa, of course, no question. Of course it's good. Your paper was the star of the show. Radha, I didn't say that. And he said, I've been working on my paper too, not that you asked. Radha, I'll be happy to read it when it's finished. And he said, I haven't had time. I've been getting ready for you to come home. Radha, well, if there's something you want to say. 
Neither of them say anything. Anissa. She's very beautiful, rather. She's homeless and then helpless. It's very attractive, that helplessness. Rather, she's not helpless. I'm not attracted to helplessness. I'm attracted to you. You're not helpless. Anissa, not today, I'm not. Rather looks closely at Anissa. Are you feeling okay? Anissa, I'm fine. I just have been waiting for you to come home so we could talk. We have things to talk about. Rather, when our guest leaves, we can talk all we want. Anissa, I don't want her here. Rather, where is your sense of generosity? Anissa, where's your loyalty? Rather, she's just a girl. Anissa, and you're old enough to be her mother. Rather, she might be able to hear us. What will she think? These women can't get their shit together. In their old age, they're still doing this. And he said, being with her is not going to make you younger, brother. You're out of your mind. And he said, you're still old. You'll still be old. Brother, stop it. And he said, grabs brother's wrist. I'm not dying alone. I'm telling you now. I didn't stay with you for 20 years so I could die alone. And don't, don't say it. Don't say it. Brother, we all die alone. And that's it. Getting There explores the various facets of love, from burgeoning love to mature, deep love, the kind of love that is rich and explosive. It therefore seemed appropriate to select a wine that would take you on a nuanced, romantic journey. Here you have Clos de la Brosse Saint Amour. This wine starts with scents of violets that lure you and the fresh, vibrant taste of tart cherries. As you move forward, you'll discover notes of blackberry which eventually yield to a minerality that lets you know the relationship has moved forward to a greater complexity. And since Dipica set the play in Paris, it seemed essential to pair this wine with a delicious French gem. Pour and sip before proceeding. My name is Harrison David Rivers, and I have been a member of the Playwright Center for six years. I am currently an affiliated writer and a member of the Board of Directors. I have received many voices and McKnight Fellowships and a core writership. I was diagnosed with HIV in the fall of 2018, and I knew almost immediately after that diagnosis that the experience would someday be a play. I didn't know how to write it at the time. I didn't know what form it would take, but I knew that eventually I would write it. I met with Mandy Greenfield, the artistic director of the Williamstown Theatre Festival early last year. She said, we'd like to commission you. And she asked me, what would you like to write? And I told her my story. I told her that I was scared to write it, but that it felt like something that I needed to do. That it felt like a story that needed to be told, and she agreed. The play came Relatively quickly after that, um, I knew that I wanted it to be about my mother, about my relationship with my mother. Oftentimes writers will talk about hearing voices in our heads, and my mother's voice was the first one that I heard. The son character emerged next, and the husband after that. My mother's voice really helped me to solidify the play's structure, which ended up being a series of interlocking monologues. And that's really how the play came to be. The title of my Play Lab's play is We Are Continuous. The excerpt is from the top of the play. Mother, a black woman of a certain age, though she'll never tell you what that certain age is and you'd be a fool to ask, appears. She has a gravity and simultaneously a weightlessness. She can communicate volumes with a look, a raised eyebrow, a pursed lip, a smile. Her smile is disarming. She speaks directly to the audience. I've never imagined my son in bed with another man. He is a homosexual, and so it would follow that if I were to imagine him in flagrante, as it were, it would be with a man. And I presume that he has been intimate with men. He has never said as much to me, not explicitly anyway, but, well, a mother knows. I know that he has dated men, or at least that he has had close male friends with whom he has spent a great deal of time close male friends who he has mentioned on the phone or who he has brought home on occasion, two or three of the holidays. Men with whom he has, even at our house, shared a room, 
though I do not know the details of their sleeping arrangements. I assume that my son was quite young when he realized that he was gay, though I don't know that for a fact. I have never asked him. I've never asked my son, when did you know? But kids today seem to know things so much earlier than we did. You know, when we were their age, their likes and dislikes, who they think they are and what they think they want to be. And they seem so sure. I should point out that when did you know is not the same as when did you tell. The two things are rarely immediately connected. Simon told us, me and his father, when he was 16. We were on the front porch and I asked him how his day was and he said, I think I'm gay. Just like that. Just like that, the band-aid was ripped off before either of us had known that there was a band-aid or even that there was a need for a band-aid or no. No, that's not true. Not entirely, anyway. I'd known I had. But not because he'd said anything. I knew because a mother knows. And Hoyt said, you think you're gay? With the emphasis on think, hopeful, perhaps, that the think meant that it was just a phase or something that he was trying on. And Simon said, no, I pretty much know. And we were quiet. Cars whizzed past. And then Hoyt said, do you want to see a therapist? A friend of mine, of ours, is a Christian therapist. And Simon said, no, thank you. More cars. And then Hoyt said, maybe don't tell anyone. And I remember Simon got this look on his face. This looked like something had just ended or broken, maybe. It was brief, easily missed. It was so fast, though I didn't miss it. And he said, fine and went inside the house. We've not talked about that moment since. The Playwright Center has been an artistic home for me for six going on seven years. I was a Many Voices Jerome Fellow first, then a McKnight Fellow, and a core writer after that. My first year in the Twin Cities, I practically lived at the Center. I wrote my plays on the Center's computers. I printed them out on the Center's copy machine. They were read in the Waring Jones Theater, discussed in the conference room, sent out to theaters across the country by the staff. So much of who I am today as a writer and as a human is thanks to the Playwright Center. And I am, above all else, enormously grateful. Harrison has a long history with the Playwright Center, so it seemed appropriate to pair him with Bedrock Old Vine Zinfandel, which has grown from roots dating back to the 19th century. And though Harrison hasn't been with the Playwright Center that long, the themes in his play resonate through time. Most people think of Zinfandels as bold and juicy, but this one has incredibly rich flavors, and yet it is quite restrained. We are continuous, is a play rich with emotion, yet because of Harrison's unique ability to tell the story with a restrained, quiet energy, an extraordinary sense of intimacy is evoked. Pour your glass now.